Great singing tonight again. Uh, let's take our Bibles to the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 15 tonight, so Luke chapter 15. And uh, looking forward to this, one of my favorite, favorite chapters of the Bible. Uh, many of you know it probably because of the prodigal son. Uh, the, the title of tonight's message is Repentant Sinners. And uh, that is intentionally designed to cause questions. And so with this, um, looking at answering a, a very important question, Thank you. A few weeks ago, um, or whatever it was, we were back in chapter number 11, um, we, we looked at what the scriptures were telling us in regards to Jesus' message. And Jesus is preaching repentance and that vital importance, and he's continued to do so since then. So we see the last few chapters, a lot of emphasis on that. John the Baptist, for instance, we look at some of the other Gospels, and it talks about the fact that John the Baptist was preaching repentance in the wilderness. And so this is something that's constantly taking place, and yet there's a great deal of question there. Now, in chapter 15, uh, in fact, the next, the, not that the other part wasn't good, but chapter 15 onward has a lot of like stuff that, that brings questions, a lot of misunderstandings. Um, with chapter 15, we know there's a lot of misunderstandings um, because whenever you look at it, it has about a million different interpretations of what any of these things could be. Yesterday, I had a chance to, uh, to lead a young man to the Lord and, and, um, and his girlfriend, and, and they, they came about listening to what we were telling, and, and we talked to him for quite a while. John, what was it, like 45 minutes maybe? I mean, just going through and explaining. I, I, we're in the middle of the parking lot. It's sunny outside, and I mean, it's beautiful outside, and that was not why we were staying out there, but, but it was. It was nice, and, um, and while we were out there, I'm explaining these things to him. He grew up Baptistic in some kind of Baptist church. I'm not sure what kind, but it was enough where at the very end I had asked him about, uh, about, the, about the gospel, or I was talking to him about the gospel and telling him that it's Christ alone, dependence in Christ alone for salvation. And he said he had never heard that before. I was shocked. How do you go to a Baptist church and not hear that it is Christ alone? And I don't mean like Christ alone as in like a lot of religions say Christ alone. But I'm talking about the full work of salvation being done by God. And sending his son to die for us and risen from the grave again. That he himself bore our sins for us. And that it's completely done by him. And so as I was talking to him, he was just shocked. He was shocked that this message of, of Christ alone for our salvation boggles my said I've never heard that before and so I asked so I had some questions I, I said you, is there anything that you have questions about um, and he had a lot of good questions honestly very good questions but one of the things he said was that he grew up in a certain way and, and he heard a lot and and his family uh, some of his family members were very religious and so in this um, one of the things he mentioned was that he he said if you ask questions you seem to get a bunch of different answers so how do you know which one's right and so we look at passages like this and think okay well this is different, and, and more than likely, it's gonna, if, if you've heard preaching on the, on the prodigal son, you're hearing things that are different, perhaps, tonight than you may have heard in other places. And I'm not talking like if you go to another denomination or if you go to another type of religion. I'm just talking within even independent Baptist churches, whether or not uh, it's, it's even, and you'll hear the differences. Um, I looked up a number of words, and, and I normally don't, don't do this. I own a lot of books. I enjoy reading and, and, and I read about these things. It's interesting, just the, a number of opinions, how people are so solidly convinced about extra biblical things that are going on. And, uh, and for instance, we'll talk about the, uh, the lady that loses a coin. And there's multiple ideas of what that coin was. And people are just like, it is this. It is her dowry. It is the collection of her income for her life. This is an old lady. This is a young lady. This is a middle-aged woman. This is a woman who is betrothed. I mean, you hear it all, and this is what the Bible is saying. And yet you don't find that in the Scripture. You just know that she has ten coins, she loses one. And so with this, there, there's a lot that is there and a lot that isn't there, and people are so certain of that. And so anyways, when he asked that question, I thought, well, maybe he's doubting what I'm saying, and he's going to try to compare it to a lot of stuff. I thought that's where he was going. But he's willing to say at that moment, he's saying, I'm willing to change what I believe, and I'm going to believe what you're saying. I'm going to believe in the preaching that you're telling me. Now, he didn't use that phrasing, but the point is that he knows that he's heard a lot of different things, but when he heard the gospel yesterday, he says, I want to believe that. I, I want to trust in Jesus Christ alone to save me, and he did. He made that decision to, to trust Christ alone for salvation. Praise God for that. But, but in that, um, the question then is like, well, how do you, how do you know? Uh, now I want to remind you a couple things about Bible interpretation. We, we believe here that Bible, uh, the Bible should be taking, taken, interpreted literally. And, and what that means is that when you look at the scriptures, there's not going to be somebody like some special preacher that's going to be able to give you Bible answers that, is, um, that he alone is the only one that can see it this way. 
All right, and that, that's it. And, and, then, and, then, and then if that person is specially equipped to be able to answer it only in that way, nobody else can really see it, but you just have to trust him. I, I heard a uh, story about a man out in Nigeria not too long ago, um, and this is a preacher out there who was saying that if you give him a certain number of thousands of, of um, I forgot what they call the, the dollar in Nigeria, not, not the dollar, but their, their currency, thousands of, of whatever that currency was, he will in return give you one dollar, one U.S. dollar for those thousands of, um, I can't remember what it's called, if, you, if anybody knows it, nobody knows what a Nigerian currency, okay, so this morning we would have had a lot of people that knew. Anyways, uh, with that, now it translated to hundreds of dollars of difference between the one dollar and the hundreds of dollars that was being exchanged, and the preacher was promising, you give him all this, God has told him that he's going to give you that one dollar, and as long as you keep it in your room with you, or you keep it with you, or you put it on display, it will show the power of God, and you will thrive financially. And that one dollar will, through your business, expand to a hundred dollars. And then that hundred dollars will turn into a thousand, and that thousand will turn into a million, that million will turn into a billion. This is the promise of God. Listen, that is wicked. That is wicked. This did not come from God, and yet they're claiming this to be God's word. And I saw the video of him holding a pile of, of tightly bound $100 bills all placed together and praying over there, promising the blessing to all those people who gave those things ignorantly to this man. And shame on him. Now, obviously, you might say, well, how dare they even give it up to him? They, they have been deceived. That's what's happened. They've been deceived. And so the question then, what, what is that we go to? As Baptists, one of, one of the guiding principles I'm thankful for is that the Scripture themselves are our are only foundation for faith and practice. In other words, what we do is based on Scriptures. If we find something that's different in the Scriptures than what we're doing, then we make adjustment according to what the Scripture says. And so this is what I'm going to ask of you tonight. As you listen, I'm going to ask you to pay attention to what the Scriptures tell us. Uh, we believe this to be God's Word, and we've made case for that over the past few weeks. But understand it's God's word, and we have to take God at his, at his word. Um, we were witnessing to somebody on Wednesday, and he would ask questions. And, and finally, realizing just trying to trap us, the question was, I finally kept asking him, if, if, I, if you want an answer, I will give you a Bible answer. Are you, are you going to believe what the Bible answer is? He's like, I just want to know the answer, yes or no. Like, well, I'll give you a Bible answer. And will you accept the Bible answer? And ultimately, the answer was no. And so, anyways, with this, we're going to look at it from the scriptures and find out what God has to say. Now, starting off here in Luke chapter 15, uh, Jesus has been traveling. He's got a lot of people following him. Jesus is quite a popular preacher. Now, he doesn't have much. He's not a wealthy guy. Uh, he was a, the son of a carpenter, or, or the, uh, his stepdad, if you could call him that, Joseph, was his, his, is the one that has trained him. And so there's reference to Jesus in that manner. Um, but anyways, he didn't have much. In fact, he didn't have where to lay his head. He doesn't have a home. He doesn't have a bed that he goes home to. He doesn't have a mailing address. Jesus wandered, and he had his disciples with him. He had 12 of them that he had selected. Now, he has others that are doing special work, about another 70. Uh, you have uh, large groups of people that are following. In fact, it's an innumerable multitude. It doesn't mean that there's billions of people. Literally, you look out, you cannot tell really how many that is. That's the idea, so he's telling us. There's a lot of people following him everywhere he goes, and it's exciting. And anyways, as this is going on, uh, the, the crowd is beginning to polarize. The Pharisees have been expecting the Messiah to come. They've been preaching about this Messiah that would come. Jesus shows up and says, I am that Messiah. In fact, before Jesus comes, John the Baptist shows up saying the Messiah is here. He's coming. So when he comes, you believe on him. And we can, we'll talk more about his message in a little bit. But in this, the whole goal was they are supposed to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the chosen one. He is the one that came to save their people from their sins. This is Jesus the Christ. And so in that, a lot of people are starting to disagree. He's getting a huge following. And one group of, of people in particular really despise him. And that's the ones that have been talking about the coming Messiah. They don't believe it's Jesus. He didn't fit into the mold that they expected for him, and so they have denied Jesus Christ outright. In fact, we saw in the last chapter, they're trying to trap him. They're, they're setting him up to heal on the Sabbath. They're questioning him. They're saying a lot of things that would, would cause people to question whether or not he's doing the right thing, and, and they can, never can trap him. By the time we get to chapter number 15, look at verse 1. Here's what's happening. He's still traveling. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now, this is important. There's a lot of people following him, and every single day they're doing something. They're eating. Let me ask you, most of you, 
How many, how many of you most of the time eat every single day? Okay, so if they're in company and you're like always with them, are you going to be eating with them in some manner? Yes. People come to visit you. It's hospitable for you to eat with those individuals. That's a part of it. And so anyways, Jesus isn't just eating with them. He's also been eating with the Pharisees. How do we know that? Because there's several stories up until, in fact, the previous chapter, a Pharisee has him over at his house. And so anyways, we have Jesus eating with a lot of people. Now, in this, Jesus is not claiming that what these sinners are doing is okay. The word sinner in the Bible is not just suggesting, as we might look at it, somebody that has committed sin. But in a way of saying these are people that are identified as being sinful people. For instance, if I were to say right now to you, there is this wicked person outside, what kind of person do you picture in your mind? Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, this guy, maybe they're a drug dealer. Maybe that person is a murderer. Maybe that per- well, think of what extreme of sins. And that's the idea of sinners. And by the way, he puts it in correlation with publicans, publicans and sinners. And so uh, a a group of people, publicans, a a betrayer of their own people who are tax collecting on uh, on in a way that would would really steal from their own people in in relation to the oppressing government that's now taken and conquered their area. And so anyways, they don't like these people. The Pharisees know that publicans have basically sold their soul and there's no redemption for them because they're just that evil. Sinners, the society knows these people are bad. And you know what? They come to Jesus and they get to eat with Jesus. And Jesus gladly receives them. He receives them. Now in this, if you look at uh, verse number three, Jesus is going to teach them something. Now the parables, it it does describe that he's going to speak to them in parables. Um, Earlier, we saw that the parables specifically are stories, if you will, stories that have a lesson. Now, Stories that Jesus speaks as far as parables are not like allegories where every single thing means something. He has something to teach very specifically. In fact, what he's teaching is about is about the kingdom. And and with that, we know that it's been laid out for us. That's what he's going to be teaching about. But it's designed for something. Those that would believe, that will help them to understand. And those that don't believe, it will actually cause a further rift there. And so by rejecting the parable, they will refuse to, they are refusing to understand actually creates a problem. And so he's going to say something that's going to address two groups of people. The people that will believe, boy, this is going to be encouraging. But then the other group, the Pharisees that are questioning, and how dare Jesus eat with sinners? How how could he allow this type of people to hang out with Jesus, with himself? How is this possible? Well, he's going to give a parable to them that's going to cause some questions, and it's really going to make them angry. And so look at the parables. There's going to be four parables here. Um, th- three parables, I apologize. Uh, verse number three, and he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? It's a fair question. And so the question here, he, he asks this, is um, if, wh- who here would, um, would leave and, and go look for that one? What man of you would, would go do this? Now, it's kind of a fair question in the sense that it's not a rhetorical question. If you have, now don't think of sheep as far as like your pets, all right? So some of you have a lot of pets. How many of you have more than like three or four pets? All right, so you have a lot of pets, a handful of you. Now with that, I feel like that's a lot of pets personally. And so that's a lot. But, but for them, that would have been income. That would have been their, their value. This is what they're worth. And so imagine, if you will, you have 100. And it's a lot of work to keep up with these 100. And then you count your sheep. Maybe it's almost bedtime. And so now you have your 100th sheep and you get to 99. We're missing somebody. So we go through and we count again. 99, 100 is gone. Surely we have lost 100. Now, if you were to evaluate your value, your income, your finances, and say you are missing one out of 100 or one one hundredth, one percent of what you have, would you give up all this group to go do something like find that one sheep? Or would you kind of just cut your losses like, well, I've got 99, I'm fine. I'm fine. The reality is, yeah, some of you would. In fact, I would. I would go look for that one. And it's not that he's going to just put them all out. He's going to invite wolves to take care of them. That's not the suggestion. The idea here is they're maintained. He's going to go and take care. He's going to put the effort into finding one more sheep because that sheep matters. And here's what the story says in verse 5. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. By the way, that means when he finds it, that that sheep is not doing any work to be brought back. He recovers that sheep, lays it on his shoulders, and he walks it back to where it's supposed to be. The shepherd does the work. This is important. In verse number six, and when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. 
Who did the finding? The shepherd. Who, who did the saving of that sheep that was lost? The shepherd. Who brought that sheep back? The shepherd. And so with this, the rejoicing still of the shepherd. Now, for me, I've had times where I lose 100% of all my dogs. I have one. And that dog will go out, and we have a little four-foot fence that worked really great to keep her in for about three weeks until she realized with a, a short sneeze she can jump, jump over the thing. And so she does. She sees anything out there, she chases after it. And there's times I have to go get Lucy. And I try to maintain a good Christian testimony when I'm out in my front yard and I'm chasing my dog around my neighborhood. And my dog suddenly, who can hear absolutely anything, suddenly cannot hear the commands of my voice that says, come or go home. She doesn't get it suddenly. And so I get, and so the rejoicing in my heart is very different <laughs> when she gets home. Um, I, I'm glad I just didn't lose it. But I'm, the, the point is, you know, my, my kids love my dog, and I want to make sure. One of my kids asked me, do you, do you love your do, um, do you love having our dog? Like, the wording is important there. I do love having that dog. Um, but anyways, she, she, uh, she takes off like every day. And so the point is in this, uh, we bring her back and there's a frustration. But with this, they understood. They got their sheep back. They make that effort. And with that effort, boy, they got that sheep. It's exciting time to rejoice. And so in this, he says something to us in verse number seven, point of application, point of application. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And so he says in this passage of scripture that there is one sinner, that sheep that's taken off, that is one sinner who needed, who needed to be rescued. And then that one sinner that repenteth, you might say, well, wait a second, isn't repenting changing and doing all these things or whatever it may be? Well, he'd make it very clear. The message was clear. The, the shepherd went out and got the sheep. That work was entirely done by the shepherd. Found, recovered by the shepherd. This is the work of the, of the Savior, if you will. Jesus is that shepherd, and we're the sheep, and he goes and recovers us. One, he's excited about it. What if you're in a place where, like, everybody's really godly and wonderful and Christian people? God wants that one who is not saved to be saved. Now, that's a practical application, but for the Pharisees, which we point out the frustration of just a sheep, but we'd still go out and get it because that represents your finances. How, how dare we lose one penny? But you know what it means more? If you have $10,000 and you lose $100, what if you have a million dollars? And what, well, all the things that you're losing, we try to recover it. And that little amount that you get for an animal, sheep are dumb animals. Do you realize when it comes to sheep, it's not that they're smart. They will literally like walk off of cliffs. The reason that they claim that they will walk off cliffs is because the way that they, they function, they're, they're really big bodies, very tiny brains, like literally. In fact, mass, to, um, mass of their brain to the mass of their body ratio, it's amongst the smallest of all of creation. And so they re literally have very, very tiny brains. And so they look down and they eat grass, and that's it. And they're not looking ahead. And so they may see grass a little further, and they will look, and all they're doing is just taking steps of what's around them, and they will literally just jump off. They will take off running away from predators in a circle. What that means, if you're a wolf, you jump in there, and you chase that one sheep, it's going to run around, and that sheep just waits there. Or, I'm sorry, the wolf just waits there and grabs it, because they will literally just stay in a circle. That's how they will run away. And so they're not very, very smart animals. They need that rescuing. And, and so with that, he gives that illustration. But look at verse number 8. These all go together. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? If one woman has ten pieces of silver, and people have a lot of debate as far as who this woman is. Is she betrothed and this is her dowry, or maybe she's got married and now she wears her dowry, or this is an accumulation of funds. Women didn't have much back then as far as financially, and so the question is, why does she have this ten pieces of silver? Um, in this, it's a great monetary value, but she has lost one-tenth of it. The shepherd loses one one-hundredth. This person loses one-tenth of it. Would you say that's a little bit more valuable now? That's a lot. So imagine of your value, you've lost one in ten. That's a pretty big deal. It's a very big deal. And so the question is, who of you would not? Uh, and by the way, he addresses men and women, which I, I love that. There's a guy, this group that's, that's following him. 
But in this, he's got, um, he, he addresses something that if you lose one in 10, who of you would not do everything you can to go and find that one coin? The concept here, if you're a man there, you would help that woman find that coin because this is important to her. This is of great significant value to her. And so anyways, it's a work that's done diligently to go seek it and to find it. In verse number nine, and when she hath found it, she calleth her friend and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found the peace which I had lost. Now I was pretty convinced, my wife had convinced me that women don't lose things, but based on the infallible word of God, they lose at least one in 10, right? Um, I, don't, I don't believe that's the exact practice that we're supposed to be drawing from the scripture, but the point is that people lose things and in the losing of those things, we understand that it's tragic to lose something, but it's wonderful to find it. You, you see what, what the point is, something was lost, and now it was found. It was recovered. Once again, what did the coin do to be found? Nothing. It just had to be lost. There's several elements to that, several rules that brought it to that point. It was brought down, apparently had fallen, seemingly. And, uh, and from there, it has gone somewhere. It's been tucked away. It's completely hidden. It cannot be found. It is hopeless until the woman who has lost it finds it. So that which was lost is found. Uh, again, the, the statement here that he's trying to get you to learn, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Again, the same thing that we find um, in, the, in verse number 7. So verse number 11, we get to the, probably the most famous part of this passage of Scripture. And he said, a certain man had two sons. So we got the math so far. There's two sons. Now, you go from 100, you lose one. You go to 10, and you lose one. And then you go to two, and the story's going to be where he's going to lose one. Now, beyond the fact that he has lost a sheep, which represents a small amount, one in ten coins, which a little bit in a greater intensity as far as value, this next one is going to be a child. And in this, he's representing something that is supposed to intentionally draw out the heartstrings. And so in verse number 12, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Now notice that the request is for himself, that he wants... He wants the portion of his inheritance. Now, the way this works, um, you don't have to know a great deal of their history back then, but the idea, if you want your inheritance, you normally get that when the person dies. It would be incredibly disrespectful to get that earlier, but he wants that. He wants that. And so, anyways, what, what, what the father does, according to verse number, um, in verse number um, 12, at the end of it, says, uh, and he divided unto, what's the next word? Yeah. Unto them. He had how many sons? Two. Two. He divides the request, as far as the, the inheritance, to both of them. Now, in that, um, there, there's questions in regards to how much does it mean he divided 50-50. We're not really sure. But what we do know in, in Scripture, and there's a number of occasions on this, what the blessing for the oldest seems to be of greater quantity. Uh, there was a responsibility that the oldest had in regards to the household and things they were doing. So there was greater responsibility. So it's very possible that it was split into three, and so the oldest son got two-thirds, the younger son got one-third. The point is, it doesn't really matter. They both got it. It was divided, and they both got it. And so down in verse number... Um, Verse number 13, uh, many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far, and, sorry, not many days after, and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. By the way, the word prodigal literally has to do with wasteful. That's what it means. And so you have this wasteful son who takes all this stuff and woohoo. He's never had this kind of money before. And now he can do anything. And all of a sudden, everybody's his friend. And so he goes and he wastes all that money. And what he wasted on is on riotous living, things that were for the moment. What was it specifically? We don't know. And the point is not to let your imaginations wander to the point where he must have done this. We don't know what he did. But the point is he left from somewhere he was supposed to be. And imagine the Pharisees who are looking forward to the Messiah who would redeem Israel, that would kick out Rome, that would take this mighty army and they'd take over and all the promises of the Old Testament would be fulfilled. They'd get to enjoy that. And this kid disrespectfully wants his inheritance quickly. So not many days. In other words, he doesn't think about it for a while. He gets ready. He gets out of there within a few short days. And the first thing he does is he wastes that money. And he doesn't even stay in the area. He goes to some kind of pagan nation, a far country, to go do whatever he wants to do. And so uh, there's a problem, though. In verse number 14, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began 
to be in want. In other words, lack. He didn't have what he needed. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. So you find that he, he goes and goes to work for a, a pig farmer. Now, it's possible he had other stuff. I'd imagine this prodigal son shows up to him and says, are, are you hiring at all? Maybe it's one that he had been in righteous living with. Maybe one that they used to party and be friends. I don't know, but the point is he, knew, he got a hold of somebody and got a job with him. And the guy said, hey, you can help me by taking care of my pigs. Now, this is about as low as, as low can get. It was an unclean beast. And it's not just like pigs were gross, because we understand that. I've been a number of times where pigs have literally made me gag. And there's, it takes a lot to make me gag. It really does. Um, but when I see pigs, it, it, it's not, not what's bad. It's smelling the pigs that makes it worse. I went to somebody's house, and they had this concrete pad they had the pigs sitting on. That's where they lived. It was, it was vile. And I remember going over there, like, hey, you want to pet the pig? Sure. Well, nope, I don't, definitely don't want to do that. Um, it, was, it was nasty because there's a bunch of mud that the pigs had made with their bodies that was sitting on top of that concrete, and they were rolling around and stuff. You know what I'm saying? It was disgusting. It was terrible. And so anyways, they were unclean things. These, these, things, these are things that they're not supposed to touch. And this one has gone, and he's defiled himself by going to take care of these pigs. And we can go more with that story, but that's not... The, the emphasis of the message this evening. So the point is as bad as it could get. He's lost what he, what he needs. He's lost what he had, what he could have had, what he could have enjoyed. And so with all the stuff, the graces that his father had bestowed on him, all those good things, he wasted that. It's gone, gone. And now he doesn't have the money to eat. And so now he's taking care of pigs. This is what he's doing for work. It's likely that there was a situation that allowed him to live there, may perhaps have some kind of shelter, but there seems to be a lack of food. We know that because in this next verse. In verse number 16, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He needed food. So he had somewhere to work and stay, but he didn't have food. And so he was so desperate, he would take the things that the pigs would eat. And it says husks, and you can imagine, basically, this is the leftovers of the food. Um, this would be the, uh, if, you, if you take and you harvest certain foods and you have the leftovers around it that you're not cooking, that's what's given to the pigs, besides slop or whatever it may be. And this, he says, I, I, I'll, I'll eat that. And so there's envy for what the pigs are eating, because nobody would give them food. And so this is desperation. Imagine your child in that kind of desperation. In this, the Pharisees could have said, well, good. This is what he deserves. Shame on him. Look at all the wicked things he did. Of course, he deserved it. And, and I can imagine as such strict adherence to the law was encouraged and required of people, I'd imagine with this, they're hearing this thing and it's drawing the ire. Perhaps it is for one that loves their child in that way that you wouldn't want that for them. You understand there's a redemption. You, you would do anything you could to pull them out of there. You would want that for them. But yet it's drawn to two different crowds of people here. And in, in this passage of scripture, verse number, um, verse number 17, and when he came to himself, the idea is he realized where he was at. In other words, he was hit with a dose of reality. Have you noticed that some people can be hit with that dose, low, dose of reality and it doesn't affect them at all? So they'll return to it again. The Bible talks about drunks, for instance, in the book of Proverbs. That it, just, it can be miserable, absolutely miserable. They can have the worst time. They can be hurt. They can be injured. They can make much, many mistakes, and the next day they're going to go return to it again. That's, this guy, it hit him, and it hit him, hit him. You know what I'm talking about? Those times where you, you finally get it. I am in trouble. This is not, not going to be a good end. I have no hope wherever I'm at. And so in this passage of Scripture, the realization is, of course, of himself, but notice what more importantly that realization is. He said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. Those people that work for dad and those people that work for the people that work for dad and the lowest of the low, they have extra food. And I, who am the son of this man who is generous, I've got nothing. I've got nothing, I have no food, and I'm going to die in hunger. So in verse number 18, he comes up with a plan. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. This is the plan. In verse 20, he arose and came to his father. When he, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This father runs. He does something that would have been out of character seemingly. 
This one has gone and he has run to receive him. Now he should be able to tell his son, good, you don't belong here, not until you can show me how you're going to behave. And that's not the issue. The issue is that he just simply had to come to the father. The father runs to receive him. And when the father runs to receive him, he has compassion. He loves him. He kisses this stinky, smelly, wicked son, kisses him on his neck. In verse number 21, the son said unto him, now remember what the speech was supposed to be. Father, I've sinned against heaven in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's been bad. He's been really bad. He's not worthy of this. But the father said to his servant, bring forth the best robe. Now you notice he's missing part of the speech there. All oh, it's like, can I have this? Can I do this? And said, the father makes a decision, bring, the best, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Why? Because we're going to have a celebration. In verse number 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now, based on the pattern we saw in verse number 4, then again in verse number 8, the application ought to be at this point that when anyone is, when that which is lost recovers, once sinner repents, then all of heaven rejoices. That the angels of heaven rejoice. But what happens here? When a person, not, not a coin, not a coin, not, not a sheep, one in 100 sheep or, or one in 110 coins, but when a person, a son, is recovered by his father, there would be people that would be angry at this, and that would be ridiculous. Obviously, we should all be rejoicing for somebody that recovers their son, but in verse 25, now his elder brother, I'm sorry, his elder son, the, the father's elder son, was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And the answer said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as, thy, as, soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. So the father's now responding. Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. I was meet, it was meet, that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. This is the lesson. Many people say that the application kind of ends here. Well, so what, what happens? The point here is very simple, that the brother should have rejoiced as well. Now, the issue is, remember the Pharisees, this is the context. The Pharisees are hearing this. They're angry. And so what it tells us is, yes, not everybody's going to be happy for you when you get saved. Not everybody's going to be happy for you when you come to the Father. But you know what? That's okay, because the Father still has accepted you. And when it comes to salvation, people might tell you, well, wait a second, you're not good enough. I know what you were like in the background. I remember what you were like back then. But the reality is this. The Father has received you. And understanding that he's relating this to salvation, what we're talking about is this one came to himself, I am lost. What I need is to go to the Father. What did this man do to change in his life? Nothing except go to the Father. Now, he could have tried doing other things. What if he had tried putting applications in with other farmers? Do you have any other job that's not pig farming? The point is, at the very lowest of his existence, what he needed to do was go to the Father. He had to go back. That's the whole point of this. And so the application, we see it in verse number 7, uh, um, where it says, uh, it, Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. In verse number 10, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And so the point here is that the sinner has repented. And so that brings up a lot of questions. For one thing, uh, what's the point of this application? One is this, that the sinner's only hope is the Father. Th that's the, the whole situation. The repentance is specifically tied into who the Father is and what the Father is doing, not on the transformation of the sinner, but the transformation that the Father does for the sinner. This is something else that happens. Now, now, this is very important. Now, we're going to talk about a couple things. One is this, that God wants to see people saved. I've gone through this passage of Scripture a number of times. I thought, what, what is this about? And I've heard a lot of messages about this. And you look at the, the prodigal son, about the one that goes and wastes his life in riotous living. And I hear a lot of preaching that says, all right, what you need to do is don't be like the prodigal. Here's the problem with that. You were. 
You were. You needed to be saved. That's the whole situation. What he's pointing to you is what you were. You might say, oh, wait a second. It's because they're sinners and they're wicked, not like me. What does the Bible say about who needs to repent? God is not willing that any should perish, but that who? All would come to, that may come to repentance. The idea here is very specific that all people need this. The problem is that some Pharisees don't realize they need it. There are people that don't understand who they are before God, and they think they're fine. He was taking care of pigs. This is the lowest of low, far from his father, and he needed, he needed his father. That's what he needed. But he didn't understand until he came to himself. There's something that took place where he finally understood, I need the Father. That's what happened. But you know what that means? That there was a time period where that's not something that consumed his mind. You ever wonder, you talk to sinners, and I'm talking about somebody that's struggling with sin, and you have something that you can give them. You can give them eternal life from the Father. You can show him this is what salvation is. Not that you yourself are the, the giver of it, but literally that you give what the Father has given you. You've received it, and you can give it to somebody. They could be saved. And they're like, no, I don't think so. I don't want it. And it just boggles our mind. How is that possible? Why? Because they don't come to what the sinner here in this passage of Scripture did, that he came to himself. He came to himself. There's no realization as far as where we're at. And so there's a few things that we need to understand when it comes to repentance. And I know the message has gone long. We've covered an entire chapter. Uh, I know normally we're not done by this time, but there's still uh, about seven more points to make this evening. So We'll go, we'll go a while and then we'll be done, all right? So it's a little longer than, than normal for a Sunday night. But, um, but I want you to acknowledge a couple of things in regards to this. One is to understand what salvation is specifically. John chapter 3, verse 16, the most famous passage of Scripture, in my opinion, in the Bible, comparable maybe only as far as the widespread knowledge to, uh, actually two more verses, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the other one would be, judge not lest ye be judged. All right, those are the, the verses that I hear the most, John three sixteen. Genesis 1, 1, of course, judge not. And there's two references on that one. But anyways, in this, uh, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The point is that he gives that passage of Scripture in the understanding of how salvation works, that it all ties in specifically to believing on Jesus, believing in Jesus in that passage. In John chapter 6, it describes him as believing on him. The idea here is not just that there's a mental assent about Jesus, but literally that you are now transferring what you're trusting in. No longer are you trusting in your past, your works, or whatever it may be, or maybe it's just your blatant refusal to acknowledge God at all. And now you're coming to put your dependence on Jesus Christ alone. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is then the salvation he speaks of. But now with this, we talk about the fact that we must, the book of 1 John describes it frequently, talking about the fact that if we don't believe that we're not saved, and if you do believe, you are saved. In chapter 5 and verse 1 of 1 John, whosoever believeth. So it's not to believe, but you do believe. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. What he describes this is similar to what he mentions in chapter 4, verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. It's describing specifically that there is that acknowledgement, that confession. Justin preached a message on, on calling upon the name of the Lord. Literally, that confession made that this is the one whom I trust in for salvation. Nobody else, nothing else, Christ alone. And so we need to understand that Jesus is the only one that can save us. But in that... There's also a no number of acknowledgments that we need to make. For one thing, Jesus Christ is the Savior, right? If Jesus Christ is the Savior, it makes no sense to preach salvation if somebody doesn't need to be saved. Now, the Pharisees are thinking, well, look at what we're doing. And so Jesus makes a very clear statement that he came to save sinners. Paul describes that he is a sinner, a uh, chief of sinners, if you will. And what he's making clear here in this chapter is that there's great rejoicing for Jesus when Jesus accomplishes that goal. When I look at this chapter, the question that oftentimes comes up, who is the prodigal son about, or that story about? Is it about the, the one that goes off and lives righteous and righteous living, wastes his money in righteous living, or, or is it the, the son at home? Which one is he talking about in this one? Can, can I remind you what the parable has been about in all three of those stories? It's about the finder. The one that finds, this is who it's about. It's not about the sheep. Nobody's thinking, oh, I wonder what that sheep was thinking about when he was wandering off. It was lost. It doesn't matter. You know, one way or another way, they're all lost, right? They go in one direction or another. They need to be found. What about the coin? Was the coin really intimately involved in its sin? Maybe really struggled to be, find, to be found? No. The rejoicing was of the woman who found it. 
And likewise, it's about the father who restores his son, who brings, who saves his son. Lost and found. And what, the problem, though, with the other son, the son that stayed home, is not that he didn't need to be found. It's that he didn't realize that whether home or not, maybe close by or not, he needed the father as well. I'm not understanding who he was. So we do need to understand a couple things. One is that you are a sinner. In order to be saved, you need to acknowledge that you're a sinner. Now, the reason I tell you this, you might say, well, it's a Sunday night. Most of us come here frequently. Most of us are here every service or whatever it may be. Uh, with this, you might say, well, you've, we've heard this hundreds, if not, if not thousands of times. We hear it multiple times in a service. This is a vital, vital truth that we acknowledge, that we are sinners. That sin means that you are a sinner. The issue that he calls us here in this and throughout these past few chapters is that it's not just that they had sinned, but that they are sinners. This was your estate. Now, it doesn't mean that once you're saved, you are no longer a sinner, but you are now a saved sinner. And so in this, what he describes then is that these sinners are without hope, though. There was complete hopelessness when it came to our sin. That means all of us. Oh, well, I stayed home. I did all the right stuff. You still needed the Father. You missed out on this chance of this opportunity for that salvation offered. The point is that you're sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the wages of sin and death. This is describing something very particular here that you are lost. And so that's how it need, what we need to understand. To believe on a Savior, you need to acknowledge that you need to be saved. I talk to a lot of children about uh, salvation, and um, a number of, uh, on occasion we'll have a child come to me, and a parent will ask about so their child being baptized. And so we'll always go through and go through the plan of salvation. I want to hear from them. What does it mean that, that you're, you're going to be, um, that you want to be baptized? And they acknowledge it's not washing away my sins. It's not that work. It's, it's Jesus alone that I've trusted in him. And there will be references about I've trusted Jesus to save me. Okay, why? Well, because I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Well, what would happen? I've asked this question to a lot of kids. What would happen if you didn't get saved? Would you go to hell? No. And kids will tell me. Well, you're right. You're right. That's the right answer, Noah. Um, but yes, if somebody's not saved, yes, then, then you do go, go to hell. But I have numerous children that are like, oh, no, no, I wouldn't. See, I'm a sinner, but I don't deserve hell, but I need to be saved. See, that doesn't make any sense. And I, I give this illustration when we're soul winning pretty frequently. If we're out swimming and there's a lifeguard there, where is the lifeguard going to be looking to save people from? The pool or from the beach or the concrete or whatever. So from the pool, because that's where people drown. If I come up to Daryl and say, hey, Daryl, I'm a lifeguard. Great, that's wonderful. It's good to know you. Daryl, I've saved you. Does that make sense? No, why? Because Daryl's not drowning. Oh, no, no, but he asked me. He can say, hey, can you save me? Can you save me? Yes. What is, I mean, is that, but here's what we're doing. We preach a savior without sin. And it doesn't make any sense. People need to know that they are lost. And if not, they don't need to be saved. And this is what Jesus pointed out. He's not saying, oh, no, no, you Pharisees, you're really religious. You don't need to be saved. Who, how many does, does God want to come to repentance? All. That means the Pharisees are included in that number. They just don't realize that they don't come to himself. They don't come to themselves. And so in this, let me mention a few other things about this. So this is salvation. Of course, you're lost. You need the Savior. Then you need to trust in that Savior, which is how this is how it's going to work. The way in which there is finding is not by the sheep coming back. That sheep was put on the shoulders of the shepherd. It's not by the coin rolling back out. That one had the work done by the person that lost it to recover it. And it's not by changing the course of all the things that he was doing. It was coming to the Father. The Father received, oh, well, now, in fact, notice the attempt to work. The one, the son that comes back, I want to be one of your servants because I don't deserve to be there. And the father says, no, you're mine. You're my child. You acknowledge there, there's that position in Christ specifically that we're given with salvation. No work. No work. And so this is vital. And so salvation is about the entirety of Jesus saving you. Jesus saving you. And so then we have to acknowledge one other thing. So we understand salvation. God willing, you're saved. If you're here today and you're not saved, God wants to save you. In fact, I hear people say, how, what kind of God would, would send people to hell for their sin? That's how bad our sin is, that it deserves hell. I say, oh, no, no, I've only done this or I've only done that. We're not understanding how holy of a God that we're offending when we sin. And that God wants to save you even though you've offended him and his holiness and righteousness and glory. He still wants to save you. And so understanding what that salvation is, I encourage you, if you're not saved, get saved. When you look at this parable, this should drive you to something. You need salvation, so get saved. Perhaps you're here, perhaps you're listening online, whatever it may be, trust Christ as Savior. 
But here's the next, next part, and I want to address this in some brevity because we could spend a lot of time on this specifically, but that's the subject of repentance. The word repentance gets a great, great deal of um, confusion. Why does the word repentance create confusion? Um, let us count the ways. And so there are, there's a lot of reasons for why. Um, one of the things that we as Baptists do is we're like, well, it's the Catholic's fault. Um, well, that's not, that, that, can only go so, that argument can only go so far because the reality is it's not a Catholic thing or a Presbyterian thing. or a, it, The issue is it's a people thing. We confuse things. Um, with this, when you look up repentance online, which I'm sure none of us look up stuff online and seem, assume that it's true, but there's several definitions. I looked at the first few definitions. Def definitions for repentance, number one, penitence. Number two, contrition. Number three, compunction. I'm not even sure what that is. Compunction. Does anybody use that word? Compunction. I hate when people define things by a word that we don't ever use. Um, number four, regret. Number five, remorse. Now, all of those, the issue with that is if you consider the fact that the most common person to repent in the Bible is God himself, those definitions start to, to really be kind of wishy-washy. In fact, you're going to have a, a, a God that is going to have to then perform penitence before himself, who will have to be bound in contrition, do whatever compunction means, and have regret about what he's accomplished. Now, in those things, what we're describing here is that there is, there is a fact that we have to go to the biblical term of what repentance means. Um, the word repentance, by the way, starts out very simple, but then it's going to get a little more complicated as we see the application. Um, first off, I would say that it's very similar to what the word believe is. When we look at the Bible word believe, and we would say the only way to be saved is to believe. That's an inaccurate gospel. And what I mean by that is um, believe in what? Right? Because if, like, just believe to be saved, great. I believe I'm going to heaven. And I talk to people that. I believe I'm saved. Why? Because I believe it. I believe that God won't send me to hell. And I've heard people, I've talked to a lot of people that because they believe what they believe, they're going to go to heaven. But here's the problem. It's not believe. It's believe on Jesus. It's believe in Jesus. It has to have a source. It has to have a subject matter. Otherwise, believe doesn't matter. Likewise, repentance is always that way. Let me encourage you in your mind to erase the idea of repentance being a self-contained unit that always means the same thing. Because while it does mean the same thing, the application is dependent on what it's talking about. And we can see this all throughout the scriptures. Obviously, when it comes to God, there's not a point where God has done wrong and now he has to sorrow. I hear a lot of people say that when it comes to repentance, it means sorrow. Um, let me just mention here, repentance does not mean sorrow. Now, Here's what I mean by that. Um, and by the way, can, can there be sorrow? Yes. Can there be rejoicing? Yes. Can there, be, there can be a number of, uh, of things that are there, but the point is that God makes it very clear how the repentance is going to work. Um, to give you, and I'm sorry, I'm going back. I went out of order on my, on my notes. But, but anyways, when it comes to rep repentance, uh, for instance, in... Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, chapter 9, when, 7, excuse me, when it describes that godly sorrow worketh repentance, if repentance means sorrow, I want you to understand how that red sentence would read. Godly sorrow works or does and performs sorrow. Sorrow makes sorrow. Is there any hope in that? No. So, th so you understand where that wouldn't make sense as far as the application. Likewise, people would say that repentance then means a change of behavior. And there's a big group out there, if you follow the, the teachings, for instance, of John MacArthur, and a lot of people follow John MacArthur's teachings. And I'll tell you what, John MacArthur is an incredibly intelligent person. I would, I would submit that I think he's smarter than me. But people that are smarter than me can be wrong. All right, I talk to people out there that believe that the world was created simply by, by evolution and happenstance and crazy events out there when it came, comes to evolution, millions and billions and whatever it may be years ago. And a lot of those people are way smarter than me. It doesn't mean they're right. Because I've also been to places where you have a guy named Bubba who doesn't understand much, but he can tell you God created the earth. And he doesn't have a single degree on his wall. So what? But he's right. But he's right. And so the point on this is that we don't do this based on some kind of background, the letters behind our names. We look at it based on the authority of Scripture, just like we started earlier today. In this, uh, we speak about, um, about this, that repentance does not mean then a reformation of our actions. What I'm talking about here is that people will try to clean up their lives in order to get saved, and that's not what it means. People think that they can come to Jesus because of what they've done. What happens when the son says, all right, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to do this. I'm going to become a servant. That's not what, God, what the Father accepts. He doesn't do that. In fact, all he does is come to the Father, and the Father accepts him. He acknowledges, I was wrong. You, and the Father accepts him. Likewise, the sheep doesn't come back. The Father does the work. All It's not a changing of our behavior in order to do this. What about commitment? Is repentance then not a commitment? Uh, when we talk about this, there's not going to be a passage of scripture you're going to find that's going to say that repentance then is the intensity of commitment. Because here's why. By commitment, you're saying I'm putting down the intentions or the down payment of my intentions for my salvation. Saying I'm going to offer you this in exchange for the eternal life through Jesus Christ. And again, what's happened here? It's become a transaction of what you have then paid for salvation. That makes sense? What it then is, that now is no longer of God alone, of Christ alone. It's because of your good intentions. And so with this, um, here's what we do believe, though. We do believe repentance is vital. Um, I, we hear the accusation made against churches like ours. say, Ah, oh, so you don't believe in repentance. Listen, that's a dangerous accusation. Because when somebody says you don't believe in repentance, what they mean is that they will say, aha, so you don't have to live for Jesus. We had a conversation, and we can go on and on with stories like this. We're like, aha, so if you trust Jesus Christ to save you from all your sins you've ever done, all you're ever going to do, then you can live whatever way you want and not, not do anything for Jesus. Well, let's, let's address this really quick. Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter 6 here, the, uh, the passage of Scripture talks about the... Um, what, what that means for us. Okay, so if it's not then commitment, if it's not then sorrow, if it's not then uh, whatever else you can come up with as far as what, what repentance is, then, then how does this work when somebody's going to believe on Jesus Christ? In chapter number 6, in verse number 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, God forbid. How shall, how shall we that are, notice the next words, dead to sin. In salvation, he's describing something about your relationship to God as a sinner, that you are now dead to sin. And so here's where it gets dicey with repentance. Now, I'll explain more on repentance in just a moment, but let me just say this. When it comes to this, people would suggest that the relationship of you to sin doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. And it absolutely does. Why? Because he calls you frequently sinner. Sinner. You have to come to that acknowledgement. You are a sinner. The terminology gets dicey because people will use a lot of different things to explain that. Um, people will say it in many, many different ways. Let me encourage you to be gracious about that kind of stuff because we automatically assume what they mean by that. Now, in this, what we talk about is when you are saved, you couldn't save yourself. Jesus alone can save you by what he finished for you, not a work that left to be done, that's left to be done by you. Jesus is both the author and finisher of your faith. And so in this passage, he says, what do we do? Well, you are now dead to sin. When did that happen? When you got saved. Verse number three. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. He's not talking about a water baptism. He's talking about what it means that you came into Jesus then by your salvation. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What he's saying is that your sin that you were guilty for, you were guilty. You were, you were completely guilty. In fact, I have a whole study on conviction here that we're just not going to touch tonight for the sake of time. But the point is that you are guilty. There's that acknowledgement. I'm a guilty person. I stand before God condemned. The law of God demonstrates something to me. I am condemned entirely before the Father. There is no way I can stand in his presence, in his glory, except, uh, bringing anything that he would accept. There's nothing. And so with this, here's what happened. I said, I can't. I'm trusting Christ alone. When we think of repentance, what we're saying here is then what you were once believing in, what you were once trusting in, you will now come to the Father. You come to, you come to the Father for, for salvation. A lot of times we'll say uh, to Jesus, and, and by the way, that's a wonderful thing about, about coming to the Father. You say, well, I'm coming to Jesus to save me. That, that's great news. He'll save you. Okay? When you come to him, he saves you. In this passage of, uh, of Scripture that we're talking about, he says something very clear is that you are now dead to that sin that you had before. Now, here, here's where this is important. A lot of people would suggest then that you now have to create this dead relationship to sin. In other words, like, all right, I'm abandoning sin. I won't do it again. In order to get saved when this is the result of your salvation. I say, well, wait a second. So Jesus saves me. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to trust Christ for salvation. 
now I'm dead to sins. That's exactly how it has to work in that order. If you say, I'm going to trust Christ as Savior, so now I'm going to make this commitment that I won't sin ever again. I've heard people say that I won't sin anymore. In fact, there's whole groups of people out there that have said, well, you have to commit not to sin any longer. Or maybe the intention of the best, I know how, I won't, do, I won't sin anymore. Here's the problem. You only have a partial view of what's, what those violations before God are. are. You didn't understand those things. You, didn't know, you don't know the fullness of that, and so you're going to continue to learn those things. What that means is you're going to have to keep getting saved every time you realize there are certain sins that are present you didn't get saved from because you didn't offer those up before God. The confession has to be of Christ as your Savior. And so with this, by the acknowledgement of the fact that he is saving you from your sin, you are now dead. That relationship changes the moment you get saved. And the problem with that is we're afraid of that. We're afraid of that. What do I mean by that? We don't want to tell lost people that. So what's, what's going to happen is uh, we, we have the idea that, like, hey, you know what? This holy God is saving you because of how wicked you were. But, you know, let's not talk about it. You need Jesus. No, no. Emphasize that work. The law shows somebody they're lost. It condemns them. Let it. Let the word of God condemn the lost person that they are a sinner, that they finally, the law could finally bring them to a point where they're eating the slop from the pigs and they would realize that they are hopeless without Jesus. So the point is they, they go to him. That's the goal. In this, uh, in verse number, uh, go down to verse number six, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Since when? Since he got saved. Okay, so now I'm choosing not to serve sin. The point is that relationship with sin is severed. The power of sin is no longer on you once you're saved. That's a wonderful truth. And it's something that we can tell people. Because you know what? We have people that come and they want to get saved. And they say, but I have this sin. And so I don't think I can get saved. Well, here's the point. You can be saved from that sin. And when you get saved, then you'll have power because Christ will sever that relationship, that sin that has a stronghold in your life, and he severs it entirely. Just as much as he was able to defeat death, he can likewise defeat that stronghold in your life. And it's wonderful news. And so we speak of this understanding the intensity of sin. Don't cheapen sin. And so with this, repentance in its simplicity means a change of mind. It means a change of mind. But in this, it's not simply a mental ascent. The word repentance comes from two words. And if you will go to the Greek, um, in the New Testament, the Greek was originally the way it was penned. It's two words um, where it means uh, thought again or think again. The idea of um, repentance would be think again. That's exactly what it is. Sorry. Um, so anyways, this one is a thought after. In other words, you thought something, and now you think something else. And so synonymous with this, would, well, not synonymous, but very similar, would be the idea of reproving where you believe something else, and now you've been proving something else. Uh, so you believe something, now you've been shown something else. This is something that's done. This is something that is a work of the Holy Spirit to do in you. The Bible describes in the book of John that the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of three things. In fact, the disciples are supposed to wait for the Holy Spirit so they can preach the gospel, because they can't preach the gospel without the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's true today as well. When it comes to this, the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts the world. In fact, the Bible uses the word reproves. In fact, in other passages through scriptures, we would find that he does other things like convinces. When does he convince? In the book of Jude, verse number 14, I believe, when he convinces the world of their ungodly, wicked deeds that they do. When does he do that? At judgment. So it's like, oh, yeah, now at that point, I'm going to finally show them they're wrong. No, that's judgment. So the idea is the condemnation that's there. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's showing them their sin, that there's a cost. And by the way, when it comes to their sin, what he's showing them? Because they, don't, they, because they don't know Jesus. They, they've not been saved. In other words, they don't have a savior from that sin. They're lost in their sin. Righteousness, because they don't see Jesus. Jesus has ascended, and so they don't see him. So the Holy Spirit shows them, Jesus, whom you have not seen, will save you. And righteous, uh, uh, sin, righteousness, and judgment. If you don't accept Christ, this is what happens. And the Holy Spirit will show that to people. If you're here and you're saying, I'm not saved, but I understand what that means, it's not because I've articulated in such a special way in my 2022 version of English that I speak, but because the Holy Spirit makes that truth very clear because there's a lot of world out there that says, nope, that doesn't make sense, and I refuse to believe it. And so this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. And so then repentance would mean that you acknowledge that. By the way, repentance is going to be about a number of things. Who you are as a sinner, you need to be saved. And specifically that you would come to Christ as your Savior. This is going to be found in a number of places specifically and when it comes to, um, to faith. Like sometimes I'm going to talk about those who have been saved as those who have repented. In the book of Acts, when, when Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, Gentiles, 
And when he's speaking about those uh, Gentiles, he's talking about how they got saved, even though they weren't Jews, they got saved, that the gift came upon them, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And so the assembly there in Jerusalem realizes that they indeed have received, oh, by the way, Peter makes it clear that they, they had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the conclusion of the assembly in Jerusalem is that they had repented. They had repented. What does this mean? They have come to believe on Jesus Christ. So repentance, they've changed their mind about what? Salvation specifically. Now, likewise, what that means for a Christian, you need to continue to repent. We continue to change our mind about what? To the intensity and such that we are giving in, we are submitting to what God has for us in all areas of our lives. First off, it's about salvation. You need to be saved. Secondly, it has to do about every area of your life. The Bible makes it very clear that you are to repent about all areas of your life when they're not lined up with what God has for you. And so, in this, there's, there's a, I have a whole, whole lot of notes on this one, and we're not going to cover all of those. Um, but let me mention a, a couple explanations, a couple um, examples. I know we're a little later than normal. Just bear with me here for a moment. Acts chapter number 11, verse 17, the Bible says, the gift given, um, speaking of that, I'm sorry, just, that's the passage about uh, they believed, uh, they, God granted repentance unto life. And so they believed on, on Jesus Christ. Repentance is described in verse 17 as who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, all men, the Bible describes about the, the command of God, all men everywhere to repent. And so here's how this was put into practice. Certain men claim unto him and believed. And so they believed with a message about the necessity of repenting, changed their mind to believe on Jesus. Acts chapter 20, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Um, and what he's telling them, he's telling them specifically this message about what, what, um, about what the gospel is, the death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, he says, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what he's pointing out here is once again the necessity of I was wrong and whatever else it was before, and I'm coming toward God in faith about who Jesus Christ is and what he does in regards to my salvation. And so we are changing our mind. We're changing our dependence. This is a volitional thing. In other words, by your will, you're saying, I'm making a choice that I am no longer going to believe in, and, and then it goes on and on and on. That I will no longer allow whatever it is that, that was preventing me from believing on Jesus. For the prodigal son, the first one, he wanted sin. That's what he wants. He would not acknowledge the father. He, he wanted to not go back enough where he was willing to say, I'm going to stay in the slop. Do you realize that he's not even out there in righteous living anymore? He can't. But what he does do, he avoids the father by working for a farmer. He gives, gets a pig job. Still, it's not enough to go back to the father. And then finally, when he's about to die from being hungry, then he comes to himself. Then he realizes he needs Jesus. You see all those limitations to that? It may be a process that brings you to the point where I finally need salvation, but salvation itself is not a process. It is the act of God in saving you when you would finally call on him to save you. And this is exactly what's happened. Now, let me finish with one last thing. Um, the book of Joshua, and we're not going to go to the story right now, but in the book of Joshua, there's a passage where um, they've been trapped chapter 22, and they've been conquering lands, and there's a group that's out there. Um, uh, as it was uh, Reuben, uh, Manasseh, Reuben, Gad, half the tribe of Manasseh, that they conquer a certain piece of land, and then they go and help the rest of the group conquer their land. Well, anyways, finally, Joshua's like, all right, good job. Now you can go home. So they go back, and they set up an altar. Now, there's a lot of commands. Do not, do not worship other, any other gods. No idolatry. If that's the case, we see it earlier in the book of Deuteronomy. You go back, and you whoop up on them. You make sure that's what's going on, and you whoop up on them. You kill them for their idolatry. Well, anyways, they go back to their area after they're done fighting, and they build a huge altar. Now, in Joshua chapter 22, verse 11, And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan. And down in verse number 12, And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of, Israel, of children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. And so, uh, verse 16, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel? The answer is going to be in verse number 25 down to verse 27, where they say basically, uh, we're, we're not defying God. This altar is not for sacrifices, but we have a river between us that God has put the Jordan River there, and for us to go over to do the sacrifices of the tabernacles a lot. So this altar then is like the old, old altars we used to set up where they would set up 12 stones, but it's just a commemoration of what God has done for the future generations to see when they see this. Yeah, it's a little different than some of the stuff, 
but it's going to point why we're still tied in with those people on the other side of the river. In other words, this is to unite us. This is there. And so in this, uh, the, high, the son of the high priest, Nea, says, this day we perceive that the Lord is among us because you have not committed this trespass against the Lord. And so here's what happens. They're about to kill each other. They're going to go to war. And things have been going really well. And so what happened? At the beginning of this, the reason it all caused was happened is, yes, we say, well, it's the altar. Well, more than that. Israel heard say, in verse number 12, the children of Israel heard of it. And so what happened then is they heard what they wanted to hear. And I'm going to speak to you guys directly here. When it comes to what you're hearing amongst the church, when you're hearing things that don't seem quite right, don't automatically assume you know what they mean by that. I have many brethren that are going to use terminology that is honestly sometimes very confusing. I have a friend of mine that um, wrote a book about calling upon the name of the Lord. He gave me this book uh, when I was 19 years old. I was preaching at his church in Tennessee. And anyways, uh, and it goes through the stories of people that call upon the name of the Lord for power. But the first one is about how to get saved. Point number one, turn from your sin. Now, I've heard many people say this before. Oh, turn from your sin means you've got to change your life to get saved. You've got to stop sinning, and you've got to stop doing that in order to get saved. And I thought, well, how is that your first point that you're going to stop sinning? But then he explains what he means by that. Three points. Turn from your sin means this. You're a sinner. You have sin. Here's the proof that you're a sin. The law. Your sin deserves payment, death, hell for eternity. Point number three, you can't do anything to save yourself. And you have to turn Oh, that's wicked. How dare you say that? Listen, is that guy saved? Yes. Yes, because he understands something. That's what this means. In fact, the Syriac language, when the Bible translation is really probably the first Bible translation into the Syriac language, around 140, 150 A.D., that one translated the word repent as turn ye. Same idea. And so in this, it's a change of mind. And so what he's using is different language that, you know what, we're not as familiar with that language because we are a little more systematic about how we do it. For instance, we're making uh, gospel videos about how people get saved, and we're trying to maintain the same plan of salvation so that way our terminology is the same. Now, in that, if we have different terminology, we might use different words. Be careful about that. Be gracious about that. They were going to kill each other. And why? Because Israel heard say, children of Israel heard of it, and the way they heard it, is what changed their, their mind about it. And so be gracious about that. But the other part is this. Your words matter. Before I'm like, say whatever you want, Rem let me remind you, your words matter. We might say, oh, it's just a matter of semantics. I had a lady tell me that not so long ago. It's just a matter of semantics. I mean, I say that you have to stop sitting to get saved. And, well, here's the deal when it comes to that. Words matter. Words matter. The way we say things in that same passage, they said it in such a way that caused an invasion. That's what they were going to do. And so if we're saying things that are confusing people, let's clean up our language. Um, when I first got here, one of the things that we started doing is we stopped using the phrase, um, ask Jesus into your heart. Now, why is that? Is, is anybody that says, ask Jesus into your heart, not saved? I, that's not, I don't believe that. I, I believe that anybody that what First John describes has called upon the name of the Lord, has trusted Jesus, believes that Jesus is who he is, and that, he, that they're saved. But when we tell a child to ask Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved, sure, maybe you heard a message that explains it all, but you tell it to a child and that child's like, okay, and I've heard, and I've seen many children do this. Dear Jesus, please come into my heart so I can go to heaven. Amen. Now, do they get saved? No. Why? Because they believe that by Jesus leaving wherever he is and entering into his heart that they will now go to heaven. Now, we, we sing songs like, since Jesus came into my heart, there's a doctrine for that. But the terminology is confusing because we don't explain it, hence it confuses people. Your words matter. Oh, semantics. Let's be more careful with our words. Let's be more careful with our words because it matters how salvation works because we don't want to give people a false impression of what it means. And so people will oftentimes be detached entirely. We won't mention sin at all. And so likewise, when it comes to repentance, be careful about repentance. For one thing, when we talk about repentance, make sure we acknowledge that this literally means that change of mind. It doesn't change before you're saved to now afterwards. Oh, now that you're saved, repentance means you change everything about you. Um, th that's not what it still means that change of mind. And God's going to continue doing that work by faith in your life as it meant beforehand. The depth of it is to what level your repentance from sin is such. You need to understand something. That's a change of mind about your sin. But when we offer that freely to the world, say, hey, repent of your sin, they don't know what that means. In a conversation amongst Christians, when we know, we claim that word here that means a change of mind, we understand something. I changed my mind about the fact I'm a sinner that deserves to go to hell. That's what I've changed my mind about because I didn't believe that before. 
But don't use that when you're sharing the gospel with people. Because when you use that, repent from your sin, it's whatever their church has told them, whatever they believe. In fact, in the CEV, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Common English Bible or whatever version, it literally says uh, when it comes to repentance, it talks about specifically um, having that sorrow or having that penitence in order to be saved. Uh, or, or some versions literally talk about ceasing from sin, and that's not what the word means. And so let us then know what that means, give that explanation, that repentance is to salvation by faith specifically. And so be careful about your terminology. Um, is there more to say? Yes. And I've preached for over an hour tonight. Um, with that, we can go further, but I'm just going to go ahead and end with that. Um, what I'm going to ask you is, ask, is to ask questions. Um, with that, if you're hearing slightly different things, the goal is not to, um, like, hey, pastor said this. Well, let's just go and be more careful about what we're saying and be excited about the fact that people can still be saved. And if you're here today and you're not saved, get saved today. All right, let's go ahead and back.